Chapter 1, Part 2 of Thirty Years a Slave, From Bondage to Freedom, The Institution of Slavery as Seen on the Plantation and in the Home of the Planter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Thirty Years a Slave, From Bondage to Freedom, The Institution of Slavery, as seen on the Plantation and in the Home of the Planter, by Lewis Hughes. The Cotton Harvest The cotton harvest, or picking season, began about the latter part of August, or first of September, and lasted till Christmas, or after, but in the latter part of July picking commenced for the first bale, to go into the market at Memphis. This picking was done by children from nine to twelve years of age, and by women who were known as sucklers, that is, women with infants. The pickers would pass through the rows, getting very little as the cotton was not yet in full bloom. From the lower part of the stalk, where it opened first, is where they got the first pickings. The season of first picking was always a great time, for the planter who brought the first bale of cotton into market at Memphis was presented with a basket of champagne by the commission merchants. This was a custom established throughout Mississippi. After the first pickings were secured, the cotton developed very fast, continuing to bud and bloom all over the stalk until the frost falls. The season of picking was exciting to all planters. Everyone was zealous in pushing his slaves in order that he might reap the greatest possible harvest. The planters talked about their prospects, discussed the cotton markets just as the farmers of the north discussed the markets for their products. I often saw Boss so excited and nervous during the season, he scarcely ate. The daily task of each able-bodied slave during the cotton picking season was 250 pounds or more, and all those who did not come up to the required amount would get a whipping. When the planter wanted more cotton picked than usual, the overseer would arrange a race. The slaves would be divided into two parties, with a leader for each party. The first leader would choose a slave for his side, then the second leader one for his, and so on, alternately, until all were chosen. Each leader tried to get the best on his side. They would all work like good fellows for the prize, which was a tin cup of sugar for each slave on the winning side. The contest was kept up for three days, whenever the planter desired an extra amount picked. The slaves were just as interested in the races as if they were going to get a five-dollar bill. Preparing Cotton for Market The gin house was situated about four hundred yards from the great house on the main road. It was a large shed built upon square timbers, and was similar to a barn, only it stood some six feet from the ground and underneath was located the machinery for running the gin. The cotton was put into the loft after it was dried, ready for ginning. In this process the cotton was dropped from the loft to the man who fed the machine. As it was ginned, the lint would go into the lint room, and the seed would drop at the feeder's feet. The baskets used for holding lint were twice as large as those used in the picking process, and they were never taken from the gin house. These lint baskets were used in removing the lint from the lint room to the place where the cotton was baled. A bale contained 250 pounds, and the man who did the treading of the cotton into the bales would not vary 10 pounds in the bale, so accustomed was he to the packing. Generally from 14 to 15 bales of cotton were in the lint room at a time. Other Farm Products Cotton was the chief product of the Mississippi farms, and nothing else was raised to sell. Wheat, oats, and rye were raised in limited quantities, but only for the slaves and the stock. All the fine flour for the master's family was bought in St. Louis. Corn was raised in abundance, as it was a staple article of food for the slaves. It was planted about the first of March, or about a month earlier than the cotton. It was therefore up and partially worked before the cotton was planted and fully tilled before the cotton was ready for cultivation. 
Peas were planted between the rows of corn, and hundreds of bushels were raised. These peas, after being harvested, dried and beaten out of the shell, were of a reddish-brown tint, not like those raised for the master's family, but they were considered a wholesome and nutritious food for the slaves. Cabbage and yams, a large sweet potato, coarser than the kind generally used by the whites and not so delicate in flavor, were also raised for the servants in liberal quantities. No hay was raised, but the leaves of the corn, stripped from the stalks while yet green, cured and bound in bundles, were used as a substitute for it in feeding horses. Farm Implements Almost all the implements used on the plantation were made by the slaves. Very few things were bought. Boss had a skilled blacksmith, Uncle Ben, for whom he paid eighteen hundred dollars, and there were slaves who were carpenters and workers in wood who could turn their hands to almost anything. Wagons, plows, harrows, grubbing hoes, hames, collars, baskets, bridle bits, and hoe handles were all made on the farm and from the material which it produced, except the iron. The timber used in these implements was generally white or red oak, and was cut and thoroughly seasoned long before it was needed. The articles thus manufactured were not fine in form or finish, but they were durable and answered the purposes of a rude method of agriculture. Horse collars were made from corn husks and from poplar bark which was stripped from the tree in the spring when the sap was up and it was soft and pliable and separated into narrow strips which were plaited together. These collars were easy for the horse and served the purpose of the more costly leather collar. Every season at least two hundred cotton baskets were made. One man usually worked at this all the year round, but in the spring he had three assistants. The baskets were made from oak timber grown in the home forests and prepared by the slaves. It was no small part of the work of the blacksmith and his assistant to keep the farm implements in good repair, and much of this work was done at night. All the plank used was sawed by hand from timber grown on the master's land, as there were no sawmills in that region. Almost the only things not made on the farm, which were in general use there, were axes, trace chains, and the hoes used in cultivating the cotton. THE CLEARING OF NEW LAND When additional land was required for cultivation, the first step was to go into the forest in summer and deaden or girdle the trees on a given tract. This was cutting through the bark all around the trunk about thirty inches from the ground. The trees so treated soon died and in a year or two were in condition to be removed. The season selected for clearing the land was winter beginning with January. The trees, except the larger ones, were cut down, cut into lengths convenient for handling, and piled into great heaps called log heaps, and burned. The undergrowth was grubbed out and also piled and burned. The burning was done at night, and the sight was often weird and grand. The chopping was done by the men slaves, and the grubbing by women. All the trees that blew down during the summer were left as they fell till winter when they were removed. This went on year after year until all the trees were cleared out. The first year after the new land was cleared, corn was put in. The next season, cotton. As a rule, corn and cotton were planted alternately, especially if the land was poor. If not, cotton would be continued year after year on the same land. Old corn stalks were always plowed under for the next year's crop, and they served as an excellent fertilizer. Cotton was seldom planted on newly cleared land, as the roots and stumps rendered it difficult to cultivate the land without injury to the growing plant. I never saw women put to the hard work of grubbing until I went to McGee's, and I greatly wondered at it. Such work was not done by women slaves in Virginia. Children were required to do some work, it mattered not how many grown people were working. There were always tasks set for the boys and girls ranging in age from nine to thirteen years. Beyond these ages, they worked with the older slaves. After I had been in Pontotoc two years, I had to help plant and hoe, 
and work in the cotton during the seasons, and soon learn to do everything pertaining to the farm. Cooking for the Slaves In summertime the cooking for the slaves was done out of doors. A large fire was built under a tree. Two wooden forks were driven into the ground on opposite sides of the fire, a pole laid on the forks, and on this kettles were hung over the fire for the preparation of the food. Cabbage and meat boiled, alternated with meat and peas, were the staple for summer. Bread was furnished with the meals, and cornmeal dumplings, that is, little balls made of meal and grease from the boiled bacon and dropped into boiling water, were also provided and considered quite palatable, especially if cooked in the water in which the bacon was boiled. In winter the cooking was done in a cabin, and sweet potatoes, dried peas, and meat were the principal diet. This bill of fare was for dinner or the midday meal. For supper, each slave received two pieces of meat and two slices of bread. But these slices were very large, as the loaves were about six inches thick and baked in an old-fashioned oven. This bread was made from cornmeal, for, as I have said, only on holidays and special occasions did the slaves have white bread of any kind. Part of the meat and bread received at supper time was saved for the morning bite. The slaves never had any breakfast, but went to the field at daylight and after working till the sun was well up, all would stop for their morning bite. Very often some young fellow ate his morning bite the evening before at supper and would have nothing for the morning, going without eating until noon. The stop for morning bite was very short. Then all would plunge into work until midday, when all hands were summoned to their principal meal. Carding and Spinning Through the winter and on rainy days in summer, the women of the field had to card the wool and spin it into yarn. They generally worked in pairs, a spinning wheel and cards being assigned to each pair. And while one carded the wool into rolls, the other spun it into yarn suitable for weaving into cloth, or a coarse, heavy thread used in making bridles and lines for the mules that were used in the fields. This work was done in the cabins, and the women working together alternated in the carting and spinning. Four cuts were considered a task or day's work, and if anyone failed to complete her task, she received a whipping from the madam. At night, when the spinners brought their work to the big house, I would have it to reel. The reel was a contrivance consisting of a sort of wheel, turning on an axis, used to transfer the yarn from the spools or spindles of the spinning wheels into cuts or hunks. It was turned by hand, and when enough yarn had been reeled to make a cut, the reel signaled it with a snap. This process was continued until four cuts were reeled, which made a hunk, and this taken off was ready for use. So the work went on until all was reeled. I often got very weary of this work, and would almost fall asleep at it, as it was generally done at night after I had had a long day's toil at something else. Weaving. Clothes for the Slaves. One woman did the weaving, and it was her task to weave from nine to ten yards a day. Aunt Liza was our weaver, and she was taught the work by the madam. At first she did not get on so well with it, and many times I have seen the madam jump at her, pinch and choke her because she was dull in understanding how to do it. The madam made the unreasonable demand that she should do the full task at first, and because she failed she was punished, as was the custom in all cases of failure, no matter how unreasonable the demand. Liza finally became equal to her task, and accomplished it each day. But the trouble and worry to me was when I had to assist the madam in warping, getting the work ready for the weaver. She would warp the thread herself and place it in the loom. Then I would have to hand her the threads as she put them through the hames. For any failure in quickly comprehending or doing my work, I did not fail to receive the customary blow or blows from her hand. Each piece of cloth contained forty yards, and this cloth was used in making clothes for the servants. About half of the whole amount required was thus made at home. 
the remainder was bought, and as it was heavier it was used for winter clothing. Each man was allowed for summer two pairs of pants and two shirts, but no coat. The women had two dresses and two chemises each for summer. For winter the men had each two pairs of pants, one coat, one hat, and one pair of coarse shoes. These shoes, before being worn, had to be greased with tallow, with a little tar in it. It was always a happy time when the men got these winter goods. It brought many a smile to their faces, though the supply was meager, and the articles of the cheapest. The women's dresses for winter were made of the heavier wool cloth used for the men. They also had one pair of shoes each, and a turban. The women who could utilize old clothes made for themselves what were called pantalettes. They had no stockings or undergarments to protect their limbs. These were never given them. The pantalettes were made like a pant leg, came just above the knee, and were caught and tied. Sometimes they looked well and comfortable. The men's old pant legs were sometimes used. I remember once when Boss went to Memphis and brought back a bolt of gingham for turbans for the female slaves. It was a red and yellow check, and the turbans made from it were only to be worn on Sunday. The old women were so glad that they sang and prayed. A little gift from the master was greatly appreciated by them. I always came in for my share each year, but my clothes were somewhat different. I wore pants made of Boss's old ones, and all his old coats were utilized for me. They rounded them off at the tail, just a little, and called them jackets. My shoes were not brogans, but made of lighter leather, and made suitable for in the house. I only worked on the farm in busy seasons, and did not have the regular wear of the farm hands. On Monday morning it was a great sight to see all the hands marching to the field. The cotton clothes worn by both men and women, and the turbans of the latter, were snowy white, as were the wool hats of the men, all contrasted with the dark faces of the wearers in a strange and striking manner. Slave Mothers, Care of the Children The women who had young babies were assigned to what was considered light work, such as hoeing potatoes, cutting weeds from the fence corners, and any other work of like character. About nine o'clock in the forenoon, at noon, and three o'clock in the afternoon, these women, known on the farms as the sucklers, could be seen going from work to nurse their babies. Many were the heart sighs of these sorrowing mothers as they went to minister to their infants. Sometimes the little things would seem starved, for the mothers could only stop their toil three times a day to care for them. When old enough to receive it, the babies had milk, the liquor from boiled cabbage, and bread and milk together. A woman who was too old to do much of anything was assigned to the charge of these babies in the absence of their mothers. It was rare that she had anyone to help her. The cries of these little ones, who were cut off almost entirely from motherly care and protection, were heart-rending. The cabin used for the infants during the day was a double one, that is, double the usual size, and was located near the great house. The cradles used were made of boards, and were not more than two by three feet in size. The women carried their babies in the cradles to the baby cabin in the morning, taking them to their own cabins at night. The children, ranging in age from one to seven years, were numerous, and the old woman had them to look after as well as the babies. This was indeed a task, and might well have taxed the strength of a younger woman. They were always from eight to a dozen infants in the cabin. The summer season was trying on the babies and young children. Often they would drink too much liquor from cabbage, or too much buttermilk, and would be taken with a severe colic. I was always called on these occasions to go with Boss to administer medicine. I remember on one occasion a little boy had eaten too much cabbage and was taken with cramp colic. In a few minutes his stomach was swollen as tight and hard as a balloon, and his teeth clenched. He was given an emetic, put in a mustard bath, and was soon relieved. The food was too heavy for these children, 
and they were nearly always in need of some medical attendance. Excessive heat with improper food often brought on cholera infantum, from which the infants sometimes died rapidly and in considerable numbers. Methods of Punishment The methods of punishment were barbarous in the extreme, and so numerous that I will not attempt to describe them all. One method was to tie the slave to a tree, strip off his clothes, and then whip him with a rawhide or long limber switches, or the terrible bull-whip. Another was to put the slave in stocks, or to buck him, that is, fasten his feet together, draw up his knees to his chin, tie his hands together, draw them down over the knees, and put a stick under the ladder and over the arms. In either of these ways the slave was entirely at the mercy of his tormentors, and the whipping could proceed at their pleasure. After these whippings the slave was often left helpless and bleeding upon the ground until the master or overseer saw fit to let him up. The most common method of punishment was to have the servants form a ring called the bull ring, into which the one to be punished was led naked. The slaves were then each given a switch, rawhide, strap, or whip, and each one was compelled to cut at the poor victim as he ran around the ring. The ring was composed of men, women, and children, and as they numbered from forty to fifty, each circuit of the ring would result in that number of lashes, and by the time the victim had made two or three rounds, his condition can be readily imagined. The overseer was always one of the ring, vigorously using the whip, and seeing that all the slaves did the same. Some of the victims fainted before they had passed once around the ring. Women slaves were punished in the same manner as the men. The salt-water bath was given after each punishment. Runaway slaves were usually caught by means of hounds, trained for the purpose by men who made it a business and a source of revenue, notwithstanding its brutal features and degrading influence. Fourth of July Barbecue Barbecue originally meant to dress and roast a hog whole, but has come to mean the cooking of a food animal in this manner for the feeding of a great company. A feast of this kind was always given to us by boss on the 4th of July. The anticipation of it acted as a stimulant through the entire year. Each one looked forward to this great day of recreation with pleasure. Even the older slaves would join in the discussion of the coming event. It mattered not what trouble or hardship the year had brought. This feast and its attendant pleasure would dissipate all gloom. Some probably would be punished on the morning of the fourth, but this did not matter. The men thought of the good things in store for them, and that made them forget that they had been punished. All the week previous to the great day, the slaves were in high spirits, the young girls and boys each evening congregating in front of the cabins to talk of the feast while others would sing and dance. The older slaves were not less happy, but would only say, Ah, God has blessed us in permitting us to see another feast day. The day before the fourth was a busy one. The slaves worked with all their might. The children who were large enough were engaged in bringing wood and bark to the spot where the barbecue was to take place. They worked eagerly all day long, and by the time the sun was setting, a huge pile of fuel was beside the trench, ready for use in the morning. At an early hour of the great day, the servants were up, and the men whom Boss had appointed to look after the killing of the hogs and sheep were quickly at their work, and by the time they had the meat dressed and ready, most of the slaves had arrived at the center of attraction. They gathered in groups, talking, laughing, telling tales that they had from their grandfather, or relating practical jokes that they had played or seen played by others. These tales were received with peals of laughter. But however much they seemed to enjoy these stories and social interchanges, they never lost sight of the trench or the spot where the sweetmeats were to be cooked. The method of cooking the meat was to dig a trench in the ground about six feet long and eighteen inches deep. This trench was filled with wood and bark which was set on fire, and when it was burned to a great bed of coals, the hog was split through the backbone and laid on poles which had been placed across the trench. 
The sheep were treated in the same way, and both were turned from side to side as they cooked. During the process of roasting, the cooks basted the carcasses with a preparation furnished from the great house, consisting of butter pepper, salt, and vinegar, and this was continued until the meat was ready to serve. Not far from this trench were the iron ovens where the sweetmeats were cooked. Three or four women were assigned to this work. Peach cobbler and apple dumpling were the two dishes that made old slaves smile for joy and the young fairly dance. The crust or pastry of the cobbler was prepared in large earthen bowls, then rolled out like any pie crust, only it was almost twice as thick. A layer of this crust was laid in the oven, then a half peck of peaches poured in, followed by a layer of sugar. Then a covering of pastry was laid over all, and smoothed around with a knife. The oven was then put over a bed of coals, the cover put on, and coals thrown on it, and the process of baking began. Four of these ovens were usually in use at these feasts, so that enough of the pastry might be baked to supply all. The ovens were filled and refilled until there was no doubt about the quantity. The apple dumplings were made in the usual way, only larger, and served with sauce made from brown sugar. It lacked flavoring, such as cinnamon or lemon, yet it was a dish highly relished by all the slaves. I know that these feasts made me so excited I could scarcely do my house duties, and I would never fail to stop and look out of the window from the dining room down into the quarters. I was eager to get through with my work and be with the feasters. About noon everything was ready to serve. The table was set in a grove near the quarters, a place set aside for these occasions. The tableware was not fine, being of tin, but it served the purpose, and did not detract from the slaves' relish for the feast. The drinks were strictly temperance drinks, buttermilk and water. Some of the nicest portions of the meat were sliced off and put on a platter to send to the great house for Boss and his family. It was a pleasure for the slaves to do this, for Boss always enjoyed it. It was said that the slaves could barbecue meats best, and when the whites had barbecues, slaves always did the cooking. When dinner was all on the table, the invitation was given for all to come, and when all were in a good way eating, Boss and the madam would go out to witness the progress of the feast, and seemed pleased to see the servants so happy. Everything was in abundance, so all could have plenty. Boss always insisted on this. The slaves had the whole day off and could do as they liked. After dinner, some of the women would wash, sew, or iron. It was a day of harmless riot for all the slaves, and I cannot express the happiness it brought them. Old and young, for months, would rejoice in the memory of the day and its festivities, and bless Boss for this ray of sunlight in their darkened lives. Attendance at Church there was an observance of religious forms at least by the occupants of both the great house and the cabins. The McGee family were church-going people, and except in very inclement weather, never failed to attend service on Sunday. They were Methodists, and their church was four miles from their residence. The Baptist church was but two miles distant, and the family usually alternated in their attendance between the two places of worship. I always attended them to church, generally riding behind while the boss drove. Upon reaching church, my first duty was to run to a spring for a pitcher of fresh water, which I passed not only to the members of our party, but to any others desiring drink. Whatever may be thought of the religious professions of the slaveholders, there can be no question that many of the slaves were sincere believers in the Christian religion, and endeavored to obey the precepts according to their light. RELIGIOUS MEETINGS OF THE SLAVES Saturday evening on the farm was always hailed with delight. The air was filled with happy shouts from men and boys, so glad were they that Sunday, their only day of rest, was near. In the cabins the women were washing and fixing garments for Sunday, that they might honor the Lord in cleanliness and decency. It was astonishing how they utilized what they had, and with what skill and industry they performed these self-imposed tasks. 
where the family was large it was often after midnight before this work was done while this preparation for the sabbath was in progress in most of the cabins the old men would gather in one for a prayer meeting as they began to sing some familiar hymn the air would ring with their voices and it was not long before the cabin was filled with both old and young who came in their simple yet sincere way to give praise to god it was common to have one or two exhorters on the plantation who claimed to be called to do service for god by teaching their fellow men the principles of religion god certainly must have revealed himself to these poor souls for they were very ignorant they did not know a letter of the bible but when they opened their mouths they were filled and the plan of salvation was explained in a way that all could receive it it was always a mystery to the white brethren how the slaves could line out hymns preach christ and redemption yet have no knowledge even of how the name of christ was spelled they were illiterate to the last degree so there is but one theory they were inspired god revealed unto them just what they should teach their flock the same as he did to moses I remember very well that there was always a solemnity about the services, a certain harmony which had a peculiar effect, a certain pathetic tone which quickened the emotions as they sang those old plantation hymns. It mattered not what their troubles had been during the week, how much they had been lashed. The prayer meeting on Saturday evening never failed to be held. Their faith was tried and true. On Sunday afternoons they would all congregate again to praise God, and the congregation was enthusiastic. It was pathetic to hear them pray from the depths of their hearts for them who despitefully used them and persecuted them. This injunction of our Savior was strictly adhered to. The words that came from the minister were always of a consolatory kind. He knew the crosses of his fellow slaves and their hardships, for he had shared them himself. I was always touched in hearing him give out the hymns. I can hear old Uncle Ben now as he solemnly worded out the following lines. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? After singing, he would always speak to them of the necessity for patience in bearing the crosses, urging them to endure as good soldiers. Many tears were shed, and many glad shouts of praise would burst forth during the sermon. A hymn usually followed the sermon, then all retired. Their faces seemed to shine with a happy light. Their very countenance showed that their souls had been refreshed, and that it had been good for them to be there these meetings were the joy and comfort of the slaves and even those who did not profess christianity were calm and thoughtful while in attendance a neighborhood quarrel opposite our farm was one owned by a mr juval and adjoining that was another belonging to one white the mcgees and the whites were very fast friends visiting each other regularly Indeed, they had grown up together, and Mr. White, at one time, was the lover of the madam and engaged to be married to her. This friendship had existed for years when McGee bought the Juval farm, for which White had also been negotiating, but which he failed to get on account of McGee having outbid him. From this circumstance, ill feeling was engendered between the two men, and they soon became bitter enemies. McGee had decided to build a fence between the farm he had purchased and that of White, and during the winter his teamsters were set to hauling the rails, and in unloading them they accidentally threw some of them over the line on to White's land. The latter said nothing about the matter until spring, when he wrote McGee a letter, asking him to remove the rails from his land. McGee paid no attention to the request, and he soon received a second note, when he said to his wife, that fellow is about to turn himself a fool. I'll give him a cow-hiding. A third and more emphatic note followed, in which White told the boss that the rails must be removed within twenty-four hours. He grew indignant, and, in true southern style, he went immediately to town and bought arms, and prepared himself for the fray. 
when he returned he had every hand on the plantation stop regular work and put them all to building the fence i was of the number ross and the overseer came out to overlook the work and hurry it on about four o'clock in the afternoon white put in an appearance and came face to face with mcgee sitting on his horse and having a double-barreled shotgun lying across the pummel of his saddle white passed on without saying a word but boss yelled at him hello i see you are about to turn yourself a blank fool white checked up and began to swear saying you are a coward to attack an unarmed man he grew furious took off his hat ran his fingers through his hair saying here i am blow me to blank and i'll have someone blow you there before night during white's rage he said i'll fight you anywhere boy knife fight shotgun fight or any other he called in his excitement for his nephew who was working on his farm to come and immediately sent him to billy duncan's to get him a double-barreled shotgun meantime mrs mcgee appeared on the scene and began to cry begging white to stop and allow her to speak to him but he replied go off go off i don't want to speak to you boss grew weak and sick and through his excitement was taken violently ill vomiting as if he had taken an emetic he said to white i'll return as soon as i take my wife home but he never came back as boss and the madam rode off white came galloping back and said to brooks our overseer if i am shot down on foul play would you speak of it brooks replied no i don't care to interfere i don't wish to have anything to do with it white was bloodthirsty and came back at intervals during the entire night where we were working to see if he could find boss it is quite probable that white may have long cherished a secret grudge against boss because he had robbed him of his first love and brooding over these offenses he became so excited as to be almost insane had mcgee returned that night white would certainly have shot him boss became so uneasy over the situation that he sent one of his slaves a foreman to panola county some seventy-five miles distant to mrs mcgee's father to get her brother a lawyer to come and endeavor to effect a settlement he came but all his efforts were unavailing the men met at a magistrate's office but they came to no understanding our folks became dissatisfied and did not care to remain longer in the place so they began to look out for other quarters boss finally decided to buy a farm in bolivar mississippi and to remove his family to memphis where he secured a fine place just outside of the city end of chapter one part two recording by james k white Chula Vista.